All right, so assuming we're going to actually finish tonight, we may not, but uh, just a little bit of a review of some of the things that we've talked about in way of discipleship and tying together salvation and discipleship, or we could go to Romans 6, and I might just do that, justification and sanctification, because Romans 6 in this has really helped me draw some lines with connection. But you remember the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and when you think about what we've been called to do, you quickly realize that you can't separate salvation and discipleship. Those are hand in hand. The Lord never meant us to create categories and do this or do this. To him, it was a whole. And you go through these things and you think about being justified or declared innocent through the gospel and then being sanctified and make, made more like Christ. We separate those things too. But as you go through Romans 6, you realize the Lord tries to keep those things together. As there's one, there is the other. Uh, Luke 8, we spent a lot of time there. Remember, that's the parable of the four souls and where we understand there that believing is actually receiving the word. And that should make sense to us because you hear the gospel, which is the word of God. And in order to believe it, you have to receive the gospel message as true. Now, why in the world at that point would we stop receiving anything else God's Word says? It's like, I want that, but I don't want this. And so you can quickly see that if you want salvation, but you want to reject the Word of God, you're, you're trying to take something from the Lord that is not yours, right? So we receive the Word of the Lord, and that's why in the fourth soul, it was able to bear fruit, because that's all it was doing. It was hearing God's Word and going, okay, my thinking needs to change. Uh, you get down to John 8, we talked about how receiving the word confirms belief. That's evidence of salvation. It's not that I was raised with the phrase, if you know that you know that you know. That's not found in Scripture. What is found in Scripture is John 8, where Jesus was saying to those who had professed faith, if you continue in my word, then we know that you truly are disciples. If you hear the word and receive the word, you've been converted because you have his word in your heart. Talked about discipleship equals commitment to the Lord. Luke 9, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross. And so we see coming to Christ as sort of a self-denial because he's Lord and you've been Lord your whole life. And I realize a child doesn't understand all this, but we're adults now, we should understand these things. You come to the Lord, you've been your own Lord. And so you bow down in effect in receiving him and believing in him and seeing him as Lord. And that means you, you can't be Lord because you have a new Lord. And then also we talked about Luke 14. That's where if anyone doesn't give up all of his possessions, he cannot follow me, that sort of thing. And we talked about relationships, Christ takes priority. Possessions, Christ takes priority. Anything in life takes priority. And that's the one probably out of all these, is going to be the one that you struggle with the most because we're constantly putting things ahead of the Lord. And the busier you get in life, the more you put ahead of the Lord. We're just constantly wrestling with that particular one. And then the last thing that we talked about, believing is receiving, again, Jesus as Lord. It's repeated a number of places. This is where we ended last week. We were talking about easy believism. Romans 10, 9 is often used on tracks and those sort of things or somebody that wants to come to faith in Christ. And we have to be careful, what we were talking about last week, that we don't reduce the law into some two-step process of being saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's not step one, step two. Because if you turn it into something you do, you've gotten away from the gospel. And what we talked about last week are these, these are two parallel statements and they communicate the same truth, that you understand what the Word says about Jesus Christ and you accept that, you receive that. And we could talk about a number of things. Jeremy talked about, what was he talking about, the virgin birth. There's so many people that deny the virgin birth. Were we talking about that last week or is that Rob? I'm going to keep making that up. There was one aspect that you and I were talking about, though, that I don't, Something about Jesus. Um, 
there's a lot of professing believers that he's not the son of God, but I believe in him. He wasn't born of a virgin. Probably the most common one, he wasn't raised from the dead. That's not possible. But I believe in him, those sort of things. None of that is in line with Scripture. When you come to Christ, you understand who he is based on God's word. Uh, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? So this is more of a confessional statement. And we like to do things, we like to turn this spiritual confessional statement into a physical thing. We want to hear you say it with your mouth like there's something mystical about that. And we want to see you believe in your heart, and so we give you something to do. Church of Christ, baptized, a particular Pentecostal, speaking tongues. You know, things we do, walk the aisle, sinner's prayer, those sort of things. And we translate that into confessing or rather believing in your heart. That would be to the effect of taking Romans 6 and making baptism magical. The moment you pass through the physical waters and I raise you up, you're saved. All of us know that it's not the physical aspect. Well, on the same token, we can't turn Romans 10 and 9 into a physical aspect. I need to hear you say it. And then I really need to know that you really, 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 really believe it in your heart. Right. So this is more of a confessional statement, more of a, well, it's not more of, it's, it's one statement communicating one thing that we hold to Christ as Lord, period. All right. And if you hold to him as Lord, you hold to him about all the statements that you find in Scripture. All right, so let's talk about something that was popular when I was in youth ministry, which was a very long time ago. And that's carnal Christianity. And it comes from the word uh, that's usually translated flesh in Scripture. Sarx is a Greek word, and we usually translate it carnal. And that's a word that we're trying to communicate somebody who professes faith in Christ, but they don't follow Christ. They continue to live how they want to live and do the things that they want to do. And so when I was growing up, that was just called a carnal Christian. They were still a Christian, but they were fleshly. They looked just like the world, they acted like the world, but because they held to something in their mouth, they were actually Christians, okay? So Hebrews 5, well, there's actually two passages that deal with this. We're going to kind of look at them both, and I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about this to make you think. Uh, but the writer of Hebrews begins in verse 5, and he says, Concerning him we have much to say. Now he's talking about, and let me see if my pen will actually work, He's talking about Melchizedek and this relationship that he has with Jesus. And I don't know if you remember that from the Old Testament, but that's the hymn. He starts this conversation about the priest, and he comes back to it later, but in between he wants to talk about this. And he says, Concerning him we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become, and you got this word right here, dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary, elementary principles of the oracles of God. You can literally translate this, and this is how I always remember this, the ABCs. All right? We're going to have to start all the way over and teach you the ABCs of faith. All right? So why is it that the writer of Hebrews says, you know what? We just got to go back to the ABCs with you. What's their problem? They don't have it to begin with. They don't, but look at verse 11. I want three words. You know what this word can be translated as? Lazy. You're lazy. Lazy and pertaining to what? Well, he's going to get down into, you know, this thought, oracles of God and the word of righteousness. All that is communicating the same thing, and I just understand it as the word. You're just lazy with the word. And in fact, what does he call them? You're just a baby. Now, I love how he's holding on to their faith, and I'll show you. You know, Paul always does this. I don't think Paul wrote Hebrews, but I'll show you how the writer of Hebrews always holds on to somebody's faith, and we need to learn to do this. 
If Tyler professes faith in Christ, even though his life's a wreck, I need to assume he has faith in Christ and just move him forward from that point. Okay? It is good for me to personally say, hey, man, my heart's really concerned about your relationship with the Lord. I mean, I'm broken over you. I pray for you constantly. Please examine your faith. That's a biblical thing. But Paul also, or the writer of Hebrews, assumes because they profess faith in Christ, they have it, and he's just trying to exhort them, push them forward in their relationship with Christ. And the big issue with them is they're lazy in the Word of God. Now, there's a few homeschool moms in here, and when your kids do what they always do on Monday morning and probably five days a week, they're lazy. They do not want to do their work. What do you do? Okay, we don't have to do anything today. I think I actually do know some moms who do that, but none of them go here. Um, you don't do that. My wife always doubled down. That was not a thing to say. I don't want to, okay, we'll do twice that. And you couldn't play the sick card on my wife because she was like, all right, we'll give you some Tylenol. You can take a 30-minute nap. I'll get you back up, and we'll get back to work. So even if they had a fever, they still had to work. She'd just give them something to break the fever, and they'd still sit at the table. In other words, laziness in our household did not fly. It would get you in serious trouble, okay? What have we done in the church today with people who do not want to be taught the Word of God? Well, we didn't want to lose them. Heaven forbid we go down in numbers. So let's just do something they will receive and like. And so we'll just kind of entertain them or not offend them or not preach longer or teach longer than 30 minutes because their attention spans. You know, we just got to, let's reduce it down to 20 minutes. A lot of churches have. We'll reduce it down to 20 minutes because we don't want to burden them with too much word. We'll sing longer. We'll do some skits. We'll do some things to keep their attention. The writer of Hebrews is not doing that. He's saying your problem is you're a child in your faith because you're lazy with the Word of God. I've got to start all the way over with the ABCs with you. He didn't say, okay, you're lazy, so let me change what I'm doing because I sure don't want you to go to the church down the road. Apparently, he doesn't care about that. All right? So, again, I'll come back to this. The main problem that the majority of the people in the church are babies is because the pulpit chose to not offend them, to keep them, to entertain them, rather than to double down and to teach them. That's Hebrews, right? We can say a whole lot about that. That's why a pastor should be more concerned about the seats that are full than the seats that are empty. That's some of the best wisdom I've ever got. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you need to worry about the chairs that are full rather than the chairs that are empty. You're not called to fill chairs. You're called to make disciples. And the only way to make disciples is by teaching them the Word of God. Nothing's more embarrassing to you as a parent than when you have a 12-year-old kid acting like a 2-year-old kid at Walmart. And parents, I mean parents, preachers ought to be embarrassed, not because they've got one or two acting like they're two-year-old Christians, but because they have a whole house full of Christians acting like they're two. That should embarrass them. It should make them change their ways, but that doesn't make them do anything. Okay? So this is a serious issue. It's such an issue that, and hey, we... We would call this not light, but here's the issue in Hebrews. They're being persecuted for their faith, and so they're abandoning Jesus. They're losing their property. They're losing their jobs. Some of them have lost their lives, and they're abandoning Jesus, and the pastor has the nerve to say that right there. Y'all are just babies. You're running from Jesus to save your own necks. You're just babies in Christ. So, you know, that's a very difficult thing. But here's the problem. You're lazy in the Word of God. Now, in the flesh, obviously we're not going to get through. We're all lazy in the Word of God. 
We are all lazy in the Word of God. But I can promise you, if you will beg the Lord in your prayer life to make it to where you thrive studying the Word of God, that's a prayer that He's going to love to answer. And pretty soon you'll find out that the most significant part of your day is the day that you spend in the Word. And you're not going to get there in a few months. You're not going to get there in a couple of years. It's going to take you a long time until you get there to where that is the most wonderful moment of your entire day. Now, you can be lazy like 99.99% of the people, and it will always be difficult for you. When we got married, it was my wife bought me my first Bible that I read. I'd never even read it. And I got married. I was it 26? I started reading it when I was 26. Read it through in one year, and I thought, I'm good, I'm done. I know it. No. It's not how it works, okay? So after, I don't know, almost 30 years, uh, it is the joy of my day. And it makes a huge difference in your life as far as maturity and not being a baby. All right? So anyway, he's got to start all over. He's got to teach them the ABCs. Um, they're not accustomed to, that's a difficult phrase, a word of righteousness. And then he goes on. Let me read Stott's commentary. It's really good. Uh, the writer of Hebrews is convinced that his reader's ignorance stems from laziness. How can he begin to explain what it means for Christ's priesthood to be after the order of Melchizedek when they have lost their appetite for Christian truth? Instead of giving their best mind to sound doctrine and practical application, many of these early Christian readers had become dull of hearing. The word really means sluggish. It's used in the Septuagint of slothful men who refuse to tackle hard work. It occurs again later in this letter describing sluggish people who need, to, need a good shakeup. It here describes those who develop a could-not-care-less attitude to the study of Holy Scripture and have failed to give themselves to a regular, methodical, and painstaking study of its teaching and relevance in everyday life. You know, of course, y'all know I'm not, we're just exegeting Hebrews and I'm not hammering y'all. What we're doing on Sunday, there's not many churches that I could do that with on Sunday morning. This past Sunday, what we did, there's not a lot of churches that I'd walk in there and do that with. They'd look at me like I was crazy. And the feedback that I got from y'all was I could tell that it was making connections in your mind. Y'all didn't give me those generic statements. Y'all were giving me real statements about Sunday. And the reason that is, is the, the Word of God bearing fruit. It always bears fruit. All right, verse 14, solid food. I don't do too much of that. But notice what he's pushing them forward to. It's for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. That's the goal, that you would walk in wisdom, that you would walk like Christ. That's always the goal, okay? Holiness. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. He's not going to leave them there. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instructions about washing and laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and this will do if God permits. Okay? So he's wanting to move forward. Now he gives an illustration. Let's see if you can catch the illustration. All right? Because this is kind of what we'll be working on Sunday, not Hebrews, but an illustration in Romans 6. For in the case of those who have one been, once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him into open shame. Now here's your illustration. And it's not hard. Ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, 
and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is tilled receives a blessing from God. But if that ground yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless, close to being burned, and in the close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. What's he talking about in relationship to what we just read? Don't think deeply. Y'all always think too deep. Nathan? Those who have been exposed to the Word of God often, but have never taken root, it's, it's a lot of waste of time fulfilling a continual promise. The rain is the Word. He's right. Rain often falls. And is that word bearing vegetation or is it bearing thorns and thistles? In other words, there's no change. Is it just rain, 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 and the only thing coming out of your, gar uh, your garden is nothing but briars? Okay, we know what's not taking place. But if it's rain, 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 and it's good vegetables and flowers and things like that, we know what's taking place. There's been a conversion, right? But this is how he ends, and this is how Paul would always end, always a word of encouragement. But, beloved, after calling them babies, he says, But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking in this way. So he wasn't overly critical. He understood their profession of faith. He understood their circumstances, but he was not going to leave them as babies. He was going to press down on them and make them bear fruit. Does that make sense? Questions? I'm going to go to the second carnal passage. Thoughts, Mr. Anderson? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go there in your Bible if you want to. That way you can look down and Now keep in mind, Paul didn't write Hebrews, but you're going to find the same thought in 1 Corinthians 3 by Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians, okay? First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, there's where you get your word sarx, which means carnal, as to, what does he call them? Infants in Christ. So in other words, we automatically understand what spiritual men mean. That would just be a reference for somebody who is mature, but he says, I ought to be able to speak to you this way. I ought to be able to preach out of Romans, you know, chapter 6 on Sunday, but I can't because you're an infant, okay? I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. There's your word again. You're you just, you're acting like the world, okay? Here's why. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere or regular or unsaved men? So why is he calling them infants? What are they doing? Fighting with each other. Have you ever been a part of a church where division took hold, ran through the church? Paul would say, y'all are acting like you're two. Okay? That's what was going on at Corinth. And Paul's like, you're acting like babies. I wish I could expound the word of you for you, but I've got to get a bottle ready because you're acting like two-year-olds in Christ. Okay? 
And then he explains a little bit. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not acting like mere men? In other words, there was a lot of great men who preached at Corinth, and people followed those men rather than following Jesus. They'd say, oh, I, I like to hear Brother Cody on Sunday. And they'd go, no, 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 no. If you don't hear Tyler preach, then, you know, you, you ain't heard nothing yet. And so they were all, they were this way. And so Paul's like, you're acting like kids is what you're acting like, okay? Now, Paul digresses, and by what that I mean, he's going to deal with himself and Apollos, but he's going to come back to an illustration to deal with their problem. So let me walk you through the illustration. I mean, walk you through his digression where he talks about Apollos and Paul. What is Apollos? What is Paul? Both of them are servants. That's the word for deacons, by the way. Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each. I planted, Apollos watered. God always causes the growth in the church. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who, he repeats it, causes the growth in the church. By the way, the SBC has a conference that you can go to that will help you grow your church. What's repeated twice in that passage? Who grows the church? God does. Imagine that. We can cancel that conference. Don't need to go. God grows the church, period. All right. This is all about those men. I just want to read it so we won't skip it. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. We are God's fellow workers. You are, now I need you to remember this, you are God's field. You are God's building. Who's he talking about? Huh? Those are in Christ. Right, but give me a local setting. Corinth. Church or Corinth. Okay, so he calls them the field, the building. Just hold on to that because he'll come back to that. According to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another man, Apollos, is building on top of the foundation. Each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it was revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive it a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. You know what that means? Cody and Tyler are going to be tested for the work that they did at Corinth. And if it's made out of hay and straw, it's going to be burned up and they will suffer loss. If it's made out of gold and good things, it will not burn up and they will be rewarded for their ministry at Corinth. That's what that passage is talking about. So if you do ministry in the church, and it's about all you men, you better do it well. You're going to be measured for that, okay? Now, he comes back to this. Remember this Sunday? I read that like, I don't know, 12 times. So in other words, how do you deal with infants? Teach them. Yeah. It's gonna, is it going to come through feeling? Do you walk into a divisive church, change the music, and make it much more, I don't know, new and exciting? Is that the way you're going to fix this problem? No. If you want to go through a church growth conference and they want you to change the windows, which is one, one uh, recommendation because the church had those old 50 looking windows and they wanted them to change the windows and dress up the front and make it the church look better. Is that going to help them to grow up into maturity? No. He starts with a principle. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? That's plural by the way, y'all. Let me read the plurals as y'all. Do y'all not know that y'all are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in y'all? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what y'all are. 
Now back to the building. You are God's building. You are God's field. What does the principle warn the people about? Take a little thought. You can get there. What was the problem in the church? Jealousy, strife, division. How does the principle and the warning strike at jealousy and strife and division? Yes. If you think you can walk into a church and be a part of the division and the jealousy and the strife, this is one of the hardest warnings you're going to find. God will destroy him. He does not take that lightheartedly. Okay? So this will come a good warning because we don't have any of that going on here. But if we did, this would be one of the passages that I would go to to warn. That is a very serious matter. Don't be a part of that. Uh, there's a way to be, a, to be godly in the midst of that, but don't be a part of the person whispering on the back backside just causing strife. Don't be saying things about people that you're not going to say to their face. Don't, don't. I could go on and on. Don't do that. So this is the warning from the principle that God gives. You think you're going to destroy my bride? Oh, just wait when I get my hands on you. That's a principle, okay? Now he goes from y'all back to singular. Now he's going to begin to talk to each particular man, okay? No more y'all. Let no man... Singular. Deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness before God. For it stands written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men. So rather than the church warning, what's the individual principle that comes? You know, that was one of the biggest problems going on in the church. But go, go a little further than that. Go back to the Apollos and Paul thing? Apollos and yeah, that's specific. Go general now. Think like a man or think like God? He's telling each of those individuals, you better stop using your own thinking here because you're acting like fools. You're acting like the world. You're thinking like the world. You need to start thinking in line with Scripture, which is wisdom, which is the Word of God. So he gives a holistic warning through a principle, and then he gives another specific warning to each individual person. You better pay attention to how you're thinking in the midst of this division. Okay? Now, that's the specific problem. I don't want you to lose sight of what you and I are trying to do. Don't lose sight of the forest for all the trees. I'm trying to teach you that the only way for you to mature in Christ is to spend time in the Word. Understand the principles and learn to apply the principles to your own life. Okay? That way, when you walk into a setting and you find the church just all at odds with one another, you remember this principle in 1 Corinthians 3.16. You pull back and go, you know what, I need to be really careful here because I'm going to want to say and do what I think, but I better remember to be wise and say and do what will glorify the Lord. But in Hebrews and in 1 Corinthians, they're carrying infants to maturity by teaching them the Word of God. And I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. The reason many in the church act the way that they act is because of what has taken place from the pulpit. Three jokes, two illustrations, a lighthearted story in 20 minutes, and let's go home for the day. And you don't realize that you're 25 years old and somebody's still feeding you with a baby bottle every Sunday morning. And you had not grown a lick. Okay, 
If you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to be a disciple of Christ, you can't be lazy in the Word of God. you got to apply yourself, and it's not, not going to come easy. It's not what you want to do. But it's something that you have to train yourself to do. Okay, here's a picture of a super healthy church. And, of course, Ephesus, man, there was Paul taught the Word of God for two years at this church. Okay? Super mature church. But what happens to this church in Revelation? They lost their first love. They lost their first love. Now, I bring that up, that point up, to tell you this. Man, things can change overnight. This was Paul's example of a super healthy church. And he taught the word there every, was it every day? Is that what it says in Acts? He reasoned every day in the synagogues? Isn't that what it says? Yeah, two years of that. Two, I don't know how many years later, and the right, John says in Revelation, y'all just lost your first love, repent. Okay, so it can go south in a hurry. But notice how a healthy, mature, or a healthy and mature church goes. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for this purpose. The equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be Children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and by the trickery of men and by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every aspect into Christ who is the head, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of maturity of the body for the building up of itself in love. In other words, we always pray this. We just praise God for how he's uniquely knitted this body together. You do realize every single person in this body has a role to play in our maturing. If somebody just doesn't want to play their role, it affects the whole body as far as maturity goes. That is really hard for us to comprehend, isn't it? But because we're knit together in Christ, if Chris doesn't play his role, it affects everybody in this church. If one of us gets lazy and you go, you know what, I'm going to turn away and I'm going to live in sin, it doesn't just affect you and your family, it affects the whole church. Right? So, discipleship begins and ends with the Word of God. You need to be taught in order that you understand, in order that you might live it and bear fruit. If you're not doing that, I could just get up on Sunday morning and pass out the bottles, tell you a few jokes, make you feel good, and send you on out and you'll be sucking on that ball for the rest of your life. Pacify. Pacify. I needed that word earlier, Cody. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> it's even a P word. The pulpit has turned into the pacifier. There you go. That'll preach. You can title this lesson that, Tyler. <laughs> All right, let's quit.